Hello and welcome to the GMI podcast, episode number 59. My name is Jed Brocky, and today I'm in discussion with Mark Hunter. I teach Mark every other week, but over Skype, because he lives in Norway, which, as I say in the notes of this programme, is just a hop and a jump in the plane. But it seems like a, a world away, a new language, a new culture. And the main focus will not only be on Mark's playing and performance that he's done throughout the years, but also his work in music therapy. Now, we've also got another episode done way back on music therapy with Nordoff Robbins Scotland, and that link can be found on the website or in the notes for this program on the guitarandmusicinstitute.com website. So if you're listening to this from another provider, do go over to the guitarmusicinstitute.com website and look up podcasts because there's lots of additional materials for each and every one of these podcasts. The final thing I'd like to say is if you're looking for one-to-one guitar tuition, then GMI offers that. No matter where you are in the world, go to onlineguitarlessonsgmi.com and you'll be able to book a lesson in your own time zone with one of our fantastic tutors. We also have a wonderful shop full of great material, both free and paid. That can be found at gmiguitarshop.com. I hope you enjoy this latest episode of the GMI Guitar Music Institute podcast. Mark, it's great to have you here. Yet another one of these interviews where I'm actually facing you face to face, which is not as daft as that may sound, because you don't live in Scotland anymore, do you? No, I do not. Can you tell me a little about uh, you, your life as a musician, just a, a, a small pot of history, and then where you now live? Yeah, sure. Well, it's good to see you as well and be here and actually in Edinburgh, not just on Skype. Um, so I live in Norway. I live in a town called Stavanger in the southwest of Norway. It's, not, it's actually known as an oil town. It's a, the equivalent of Aberdeen is to Scotland, like an oil town there. So they've had the boom and, the, and all sorts of prices. Um, I moved over there 12 years ago because I met a Norwegian partner as I was doing a gig in Norway. In fact, I, I met a, a lovely blonde woman there. And uh, after a bit of back and forwards between Scotland and Norway, we decided to settle there and got a family there now, got two daughters and that was the reason I went in the first place. I was playing music. I was actually playing uh, playing bass in, a, in an original, what would I call it? An, a, an original Irish pub band. <laughs> always, always a need for that. <laughs> Absolutely. So it was, uh, you know, lively dancing music, but we did it all our own stuff. And uh, one way or another, we got a gig in Norway and uh, th- these things happened. I was doing a lot of music at the time, various bands, various... Uh, it's always exciting when you get to play in another place, isn't it? Absolutely. And it always also gives you that feeling of authority when you go back to wherever you come from, don't you feel? Definitely, definitely validation or something. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I know you because we've been, I've been teaching you guitar on Skype, but um, actually, weirdly, you said that you'd seen me play in another life about 25 years ago in Maison Hector. Yeah. Yeah, isn't Absolute, that weird? Absolutely. It's a yeah, small yeah, world. Yeah. So there you are, touring about. But you, you play guitar as well as bass back then? Yes, yes. I played I played both. Then I predominantly played bass for, for many years in bands, and guitar was slightly more of a side thing. Now, now it's more front and centre. But yeah, I played in a variety of... Then it was mostly original bands playing surf music, 60s, garage music, all sort of rockabilly. Various. What's the guy? Um, Dick Dale. Dick Dale. Yeah. 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 Did you do that stuff? Yeah, we did some of that stuff. Absolutely. I bet that went down a storm. Yeah. Yeah. People. Ah, oh, they always warm to that, aren't they? <laughs> and I never. It's weird, isn't it? It's so indicative of an era, and yeah, it never goes out of fashion. Absolutely. I think the heyday was between sixty one and sixty three, and, <laughs> and then it was over. But it's uh, still here. Somewhere. That's fantastic. So there you are. You, how did you get into playing music? I mean, what what was the the, the the thing that got you into that? You're from a musical background, musical family? Not necessarily. I remember I had some unsuccessful violin lessons when I was really small and just had no idea what was going on. And it was just a kind of a stressful Tuesday morning. 
So never thought much about it. And then was I was older, I was 14, I think, and some friends uh, in the music department at school. We weren't taking music, but some friends found a guitar and somebody showed me some basic chords, a little blues riff, maybe some rock, some Eddie Cochran stuff. And I was just hooked and folk immediately formed a band before we knew anything. Isn't it weird music. that people of roughly, because I know you're younger than me, but back then... I mean, music was just like, let's make a band. Yeah. It's what you did. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't I it? I, I mean, I'm so glad it was like that for us. Absolutely. I remember we, our first gig after, I don't know, four months of playing was an open night at Stirling Folk Club. Is that where you're from? Yeah, I'm from Stirling. Yeah, grew yeah. up there. And, was uh, it not the Rapploch, was it? It wasn't the Rapploch, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, just for people around the world, the Rapploch. Is a notorious part of this. It's called a city now, but yeah. Stirling is really a town, yeah. and um, it's it's had a checkered past, which was um, the great uh, bright spot in its perhaps change was a uh, uh, people from Colombia, I think it was, came over with an orchestra, and so, so people from Colombia came over to Stirling to help people get out of poverty. In Scotland. Work that out if you want. Go figure. <laughs> anyway, back to you, Mark. <laughs> oh, it was our first gig, so I can tell you, that I know the songs that we played. <laughs> it was three songs. That I know you never forget my... your first. Never forget. Me neither. Never forget. Well, skiffle music, so it was a Terry and Jerry song. An 80s skiffle band, mm-hmm. a rockabilly look. Actually, do forget the name of it. We, we played a Jesus and Mary Chain song, kind of Scottish punk band. And we played a Buddy Holly song. All with the same chords, of course, you know. But, yeah, but you got to play gel it together. <laughs> the first chord, the first songs I ever played at uh, Preston Pans um, was, and I was singing, believe it or not, um, Rock and Roll, Led Zeppelin, um, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, oh. and E Another, which I, I can't even remember. So. <laughs> so anyway, back to you. So there you are. And that, that really was it. That was it. And that, that became a... A band that became an original band at the age of 14, 15. I began singing because I didn't take the step backwards <laughs> when, we, when we needed a singer, nobody else volunteered. So I became a reluctant singer and then ended up writing songs as well. Riffs, Did songs. you have hopes to you know cut through up to a point, but not, not, not high hopes, not high ambitions like that? To have fun and do, do, do what we could do the, to, to the best. That we could do it really, you know, and yeah. Did you keep in touch with any of those guys of the old just going to the four winds? Last night in Edinburgh, here I was staying with the, the, ah. the drummer. All yeah. oh, right, still so, a thing. And well, you talking about the old days? We sometimes do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? So, okay, um, what's your feelings about the guitar and how important is it and how important is music to you? Yeah, it's that's a really interesting question actually because it's uh, it does become I think personal very for for everybody, and even speaking to a, a friend a few nights ago who plays guitar, just for a hobby, just for a hobby, absolutely, <laughs> not to put that down at all, but it's that ability to to spend some time with yourself and be satisfied, to work on things, work on if you're looking at it as a puzzle or a have a little goal that you can aim towards, get better at doing something, self-improvement, just immersing yourself in sound, just being happy with that thing. I'm talking about being alone to to maybe get a little bit of a handle on the instrument that you've got to spend, you have to spend time with. So So not not to to flag up the, the future of this interview too much, but do you think there is a therapeutic element for anyone? Yes. I think so. I think you could use that word quite easily. And and I notice not many people would bulk if you said, nobody would react very much if you said, oh, music is like therapy for me. Whether it's listening, you know, being out and immersed in a gig or playing music yourself or, or with people, I think everybody can quite easily take a little leap there and say, that's that's my therapy. Up, up to a point, you yes. know, on a scale maybe, yeah. Um, and that sort of the, the art of practice, the discipline and losing yourself in that. Yeah, 
and that that's maybe a side of therapy for for myself that I can actually progress and try and you know reach some goals that I want to reach, which is just a a, a great endless thing in life that I can do. So, you know, when 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 we were young, we wanted to work in the music industry. Not everyone managed to do that for a whole lot of reasons, including not wanting to. But for you, um, what happened with you? Did you continue to work in the music industry or was it always something that you were happy to do as a sort of side, part, part pro type approach? It, it's, been a, it's been some waves uh-huh. up and down. I've had jobs and uh, I've been pro, semi-pro and then I've been making a bulk of my living in my 30s out of playing music and cover bands. Um, then I decided to actually study what what year? What age were you when that happened? Well, the I was forty when I started a, a master's in music therapy. So. Ah, and w- what brought you to that point? Did did you feel you needed to actually? Um, well, you may have been interested in music therapy, but did you feel you needed to have a career that actually brought in some money? Perhaps, I, perhaps that stability. Uh, that question of stability and financial income, that was part of it. I remember meeting loads of people in, in bands I was playing then, lots of fiddle players and Scottish uh, Cayley bands and wedding bands that uh, started talking about music therapy, how they'd been working as a music therapist or training to be or or if not fully qualified, what can I say, working maybe with people with disabilities in a therapeutic way, even if you we can so what did you know about music therapy um, before you actually embarked on this degree? Well, I certainly found a lot of music therapists, talked to them. I, I, I found it fascinating. I wasn't thinking so much about the profession. I was thinking about well, how this thing that I have such a great relationship with music, how it's actually quite accessible. I started with no training to playing music, you know, just playing basic stuff and self-taught um, and thinking, well, what, it's, it was clear to me, I think a lot of people can get a lot out of music, playing music, without being very trained as well. Hmm. So the therapy part of it, I mean, we're, a lot of uh, our listeners may be aware, and if they're not aware, you should check some of the videos on YouTube out, of people who have uh, dementia and everything goes, but their ability to remember lyrics and sing songs or play musical instruments, doesn't seem to go. Yeah. Um, what is the therapy part of music therapy? And, and maybe actually it would yeah. be good for you to just give our listeners a bit of a definition about exactly yeah. what music therapy is all about. Yeah, so if I'm thinking of it as a profession, up until now I've been thinking of it as, a, as two words, music and therapy, but for, defined now as a, a profession that started with an amazing body of work by uh, an American composer called Paul, Paul Nordoff and an English uh, teacher who was working in a school for kids with special needs called uh, Clive Robbins. They, they met pure coincidence in the 19, late 1950s in England when Paul Nordoff was taking a sabbatical. I think he was quite well-known composer in Broadway. Yeah, he's an American, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I should just say that I actually carried out quite a few years ago, and the podcast is available with um, a practitioner and the leader of the Scottish part of Nord of Robins. Um, it may be worth uh, you, dear listener, checking that out if you are interested. Uh, th- sadly, Nord of Robins Scotland no longer exists, which was both a shock and a tragedy. Um, but you actually did interface with them, didn't you? Um, yeah, the, the actual training I did um, is a degree called the Nord of Robbins Music Therapy, master's degree. You get different styles of music therapy in different countries, but the the actual degree I did was, was based on their, their body of work, which they, for many years, they basically almost lived next to this school. Um, took many, many quite well-known f- case studies of individuals who had various things going on from autism to Downs to all kinds of disabilities and challenges in their life and worked on the most amazing amount of 
what can I say, creative musical solutions to enhancing their lives to, to, to another level. Their, their work was quite special. They notated it, they recorded a lot of the work, they wrote it down, they analysed it, kind of put it into an academic kind of uh, literature. How, how did people. they manage to fund themselves at the beginning on something that was so new? That is a very good question. I do not know the answer. Clive Robbins was working in this school and I presume they got some funding, but I don't think there were there wasn't a lot of money even for them. So based on what they did in that school, they then managed to create the company? Well, they, they became academics, they became the founders of this profession, and I guess it would have been the, the basis of uh, universities taking their research and using it as a basis for okay. a degree course. Okay. I, 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 you know, I didn't ask, um, to all you listeners out there, I haven't asked Mark to... Uh, Suss up on Nord of Robbins. Mm-hmm. So if you don't know answers about that, that's cool because I didn't ask you to, and, and nor need you know. But um, it's just weird how Nord of Robbins has managed to get to the point that it now is. Absolutely, yeah. What, what's your feeling about Nord of Robbins, their work, their research? and um, I think it was incredible, absolutely incredible, um, both from a human point of view, what to two people invested in such an amazing idea, concept and following through and how it became this academic uh, rigour. I think that's incredible. From the humanistic side, musically as well, they were experimenting. If you see some videos of them, they're they're having a good old time leaning over the pianos, smoking cigarettes. Everyone did. (laughs) Even the patients. Absolutely. Good old days. So, um, but very unique. What I would say about it, very, very unique. So maybe quite hard to replicate, right? If that can be. So they used to have a place uh, in a small town in Scotland called Broxburn, and um, do you know if that still exists or has that been swept away as well? I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you did a four-year degree. It was a two-year masters. So. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. And what happened then? Well, then, it wasn't long after then that I moved to Norway because I'd already met my Norwegian partner and uh, that was part of the reason for doing a, what can I say, a recognised profession. I thought it might give me a better start when I moved abroad to another country. And I knew, I was aware that music therapy was very well known and much more integrated in Norway than it might be here. Do you, sorry, do you, do you need a... a an ordinary degree before you can do a master's. You do, yes. I missed out. I I, I got a I scraped by with an ordinary degree at Edinburgh University in uh, in general arts. I started in history. Ah, so it became a general arts degree. So were you thinking about moving into tuition? Uh, being a teacher in history? Or Never ever wanted to do that. It was just I didn't know what to do when I was seventeen. I got you. So the, there I was. The trouble with history is there's no future in it, is there? <laughs> but anyway, boom, boom. Um, that is interesting. What you you moved to Norway? You're suggesting that there's a a, a big difference in the way that uh, society at certain levels works in Scotland and works in Norway. Could you maybe expand on that? Yeah, <laughs> very much so. They are very close in geography, Norway and Scotland, and a lot of people make the analogy that small countries, five million or so population, uh, dominated by bigger countries next to them. We've both had a something of an oil boom. But for me, that's kind of where the similarities end between the two countries. It's, it's that there's, there's something going on in Norway with, what would I say, it's social responsibility. That sounds like something that's come out of a think tank <laughs> or a quango. I like it though. Tell me what social yeah. responsibility is. I don't know what my younger self would think of social responsibility. but uh, So it just means that everyone's looking out for everyone else? Yeah. You, you, there's a great, for example, there's a great benefit system in Norway. And, and, it, and it works so long as people are socially responsible and don't abuse it too much. And how, how do you manage to do that in a society? It's a really good question. I think it must go a long way back. Um, it was maybe mentioned to you earlier when we chatted about the... Maybe in the UK and in Scotland, maybe society had become a bit more fractured. If you talk about industrial revolution and ripping people away from a rural way of life 
Norway, my experience of Norway is that you're not so far away from that past at all. It's every town is just by the coast, small towns. Um, people have very uh, many people close to me are maybe farms from from farmers from a generation ago. The, you know, you know, there's one. Don't know if this completely um, lines up. In England and Scotland and Wales and Ireland, there's been a great history of migration to America or Australia after famines and so on. The Scottish diaspora is huge, isn't it? Well, the same thing kind of happened in Norway in something like the 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, hard times in the land. Lots of Norwegians moved to America. The, the astonishing thing is that, that a lot of them moved back in the 40s and 50s. They actually brought back guitars, Cadillacs, Elvis records, fridges with the original American wiring. There's still communities and I, I play with that. I, I play in a band with a guy whose mother, whose father, sorry, did exactly that, went to Brooklyn and, so, and was pulled back. Would that suggest <laughs> that the reason Norwegians left was of the, more of their own volition as opposed to the communities across the British Isles where in many cases they were evicted and ejected. That would maybe be accurate because I think from what I can gather from, it's a story I've heard from so many people, they moved for opportunity to America. This is where I can go, work, find these amazing new modern ideas and things. But they maybe went one or two people in a family and then the matriarch would maybe pull them back home to Norway to the traditional way of life almost so that that I've never heard that story happening from anywhere in the British Isles I'm sure it has but I don't think that's the I think people leave and I think that's it it's kind of weird because my um, mum she uh, left with her family and went to Canada and, uh, and then the, um, then they came back <laughs> to, well, to, to, to a small mining village in a, a poor, small, a very, very strange. So it m might maybe happens occasionally. Yeah. So uh, carry on with what you're talking about, social <laughs> responsibility. Yeah. And how, how does that play through the, the how people interface with each other, the systems that are in place, and crucially, uh, moving on to music therapy? It's a really modern country, so... Um it embraces a traditional way of life and a modern way of life and I think this social responsibility family ties it's almost like if you're doing something bad somebody will you know your your mum's brother will find out about it and you know and will lift you up to to put you back on the right track so there's a, there's a kind of it's all, it sounds sinister I don't mean to say that, but a hidden hand that can keep the country on track because they have it good in terms of uh, a life, a standard of life, a support, working hours, work-life balance. Because Norway is one of the richest countries in, Euro in yeah. Europe, if not the world, isn't that right? I think that's right, yeah, I think that's right. And, and the, the work-life balance and the happiness factor, if that can be judged at all, I think it is, uh, is quite high as well. Right. They're very respectful of family time. <laughs> it's not often they'll be working 90 hours a week to... So it's not the American mortgage. model of living to work? Far from it. The Americans that come and work in the oil wonder where everybody is at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Right. <laughs> right. They're all in our cabins. Well, we know where they are in Scotland. They're in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those days are gone. That was from another era. <laughs> so, um... Tell, how, how does that work through... Uh, well, maybe it would be nice for the listeners to understand how you then got employment in... Uh, Music therapy. So yeah. you've got your masters. Yeah. You've met your partner, your yeah. life partner. You've moved over to Norway. Yeah. That must have been a big challenge for you, especially since yeah. I've heard. I mean, I I, I studied Russian at school. <laughs> How long did it take you to get used to a language that is said to be one of the most difficult in the in the world to learn? Yeah. Well, I'm still getting used to it. Put it that way. Um, Could you say a little bit Norwegian to us? Yeah, I can snack a little Norsk. My British is stuck a little for storm egg. I snack a little Mr. Wanger dialect dog, so can't you delete Vanskly? That was very impressive. 
it's, it's, yeah, it sounded like I thought you'd lost control of your tongue. <laughs> that is excellent. Um, so you were talking about Stavanger and you you link it there or something like that. Yeah, I was talking about I can speak a bit Norwegian, but I speak with a bit of a Stavanger dialect. Ah. So maybe it's a bit difficult for people from Oslo to understand me. <laughs> well, speak that's Norwegian. brilliant, eh? You go all that trouble and then they still can't understand you. <laughs> so um, I didn't know that there was dialects... Because in some countries there aren't dialects. Yeah. Oh, they're very proud of them in Norway. They, 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 yeah. yeah, I had great difficulty even underst- after I could speak Norwegian, great difficulty understanding a colleague from Oslo. Right. Which is very flat. It's right. almost Swedish, I think. You know, I've got so. you. But, so anyway. But the language, yeah. So um, I had a little bit of exposure to it. I haven't met my partner and uh, visited there, but, you know, nothing really can prepare you. The, the, the thing I did... I did a course as soon as I arrived. This is for all immigrants to Norway. I did an A1 course in Norwegian, mm-hmm. the first level. So there I was with everybody, the Latvians and the Lithuanians and the old German and Polish and Syrians. Th- those courses teach you as much about Norwegian culture as they do language. Th- they let you know, you know what Norwegians do in their free time, uh, what's expected of you as a citizen. Mm-hmm. The National Day, which is of utmost importance in Norway. And is what the, is that commemorate? It's the foundation of founding of Norway, the Norwegian constitution, just over 200 years ago. Uh, it's very innocent and completely unique, not like any national day I've ever come across in any other country. So it's astonishing. So you have to get that as well. I get the feeling from talking to you, Mark, that you really feel you've gone home. I think so. You know, the, 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 that, the, the word of integration that I have to use, because... It's a struggle at first, I think, anybody who moves to another country, and the language was incredibly hard. The basic course I did didn't prepare me for work. I couldn't work as a music therapist at first. I didn't have a language. I did some music work. I got some work as a what we would call a care assistant with a, a man who had Tourette's. And, uh, that was a, must have been interesting. He spat the whole time at Tourette's, ticks, hopped, jumped, shouted, screamed, drank alcohol. I guess you learned a lot of swear words in the region. Absolutely, yeah. That's what um, that's where I learned my language. That's where I learned Norwegian, working with him and, and colleagues in, in in that place. How long did it take you to understand that you now could actually understand everything? I, I think maybe a, I think maybe a couple of years, over a year before I can get a bit comfortable. That's actually. pretty pretty impressive. And I think you just have to have to actually study a bit, even though the best thing is to jump in and hear everything. Was there at times where you're kind of despairing? Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still do so from time to time. And that's a, it's an amazing achievement on, I, in and of itself. Yeah. It, stubbornness, maybe, but yeah, yeah. But I, mm-hmm. all I know, guys, if I can do it, my God, anybody can. So, how did you then move from being a care assistant into this, which sounds are really great? So, yeah. so, just so people know, you're not just doing music therapy, mm. you're also a guitar tutor in Norway. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, we can talk about the guitar tutoring thing as well, mm. and I, I want to, but how do you get into the music therapy? So I'd, I'd kind of had enough of this care job. <laughs> <laughs> <I bet. laughs> after, after a while, very demanding, and not, not really my uh, my thing, and ended up just, just approaching a few music schools in, uh, in Stavanger and San Nesa, the, the next town. I got some uh, oh, V-car work, substitute work for teachers who couldn't turn up. I just got a foot in the door. Right. But the, the, the main thing that turned it was in every single town, uh, small town in Norway, you have a, something called a culture school. Right, that Kul- sounds interesting. Kulturskul. A well, school is the same word. There you go, kultur. <laughs> See, <laughs> I'll wait you half an hour, I'm already picking up on You've got it. <laughs> So every town has these, and uh, that's where after school you can send your kid to learn violin, become part of an orchestra, do drama, dance, all kinds of funky, cool stuff. How, dance, how fantastic is that? It's funded by the government. So you pay, but it's not a huge fee for each semester. What's the take-up percentage-wise of the population? I think every person I know has gone to a culture school of, really? of, of it doing something even just for a semester to and is it a bit of a sop or do they take it seriously um, they, they take culture seriously they, they do very seriously I would say it's more often it's seen more of as an activity the same way that you would go to 
a little kid would go it's to like gymnastics. after schools class. Yes, yes, that's often. But then, what an opportunity. It's, it's up to you as a kid or the parents of that kid to decide, we're going to take this seriously, we're going to make sure little Per uh, practices his violin every day or, uh, you know. And how many instruments and artistic activities do they offer? And does it vary Mass, from... Massive range. So in, in, a, in a guitar team, we've got, I think it's five tutors, one's bass, specialist in electric, and uh, double bass. Electric guitar, they call that rhythmi, rhythmic guitar in Norway. Classical guitar tutor we've got as well. So, wait a minute, you're in Stavanger. Mm-hmm. How many of these culture schools are there in I, Stavanger? I live, I live in Stavanger. I work in the next town, which is 10 minutes in a train, about 10 kilometres away. There's one near, a massive one in the next town. Stavanger's a bigger town. There's a huge culture school there. I could work, I could choose to work in about five or six or seven that are in the commutable area for me. Um, frustratingly, though, you're only getting a couple of hours each day, aren't you? I mean, yeah. Because they'll all be at the same time. As a substitute, yeah. <laughs> you can't stack them up. No, 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 no. <laughs> you're either here or there. Yeah. That sounds fascinating. Do you do you um, feel that it has a an imprint on Norwegians? I think so, because as a country, they're, they're quite aware that they're, they're up there and out there on the tip of Europe. They're, they're the centre of no culture, in a way. Skiing culture is what they're going to be the centre of. But in terms of anything artistic, creatively, they know that they're kind of out there. So they like to try and take on board. It's, it's welcoming this culture in. Who's, who, who, did, who devised this and who... Th- well, it was the, the culture school I work at just had their 60th uh, anniversary, so wow. 60 years of that. That came out of music school, and I guess at some point it, it, it broadened out to be far more inclusive, you know, as opposed to just sending your kid to learn to play an orchestra. It became this much broader thing that we could, uh, we could do anything we want. I can be very creative in my job. I can make up things for... So kids to do. Is that your guitar tutoring part? That's my guitar tutoring. That's where I got the job first. A little position that got bigger and bigger and eventually became permanent. And uh, part of the permanent position, they knew about my music therapy uh, background. That helped with getting the job because you've got to get some uh, level of education to be <laughs> and to be a did, teacher. Did you need any cert- certification in Norway? Yeah, you've got to send you send away all your university points, they tally them up, but they get certified. And Remember all. what points make? Prizes! Prizes. <laughs> <laughs> That's an in-joke, folks. It's okay. Anyway, uh, points make prizes, but yeah, so it's, that's like, it's the world over, isn't there? There's a sort of matrix of, yeah. uh, and, and no matter where you go, I don't know if it's equivalent, is there, a, is there an equivalency across the board, or are some universities seen as Oh yeah, is there? That, that I don't know. Yeah. I, don't I, I, know. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if, if if that a Harvard degree might get you further. Yeah. yeah, I wonder about that. Anyway, um, so you did all that, and did you have to take any exams over there as well? The the, the only exam I took actually, you need a level of uh, language that's B one is the is the level that you need, but you have to prove that you're at that level of language. So A is lower than B. Yeah. So going that way. Right? Yeah. I thought when you said A1, I thought, wow, that's pretty high. Oh, Coming in. No, no. So it's, it's going up, so it's Z, it's all. So it's a logical country, so A's, A's always going to be first, no matter what it means. How many letters in their alphabet? Do you know? <laughs> um, there's a few more vowels. A few more that, vowels. That's, the, there's the, the, yes, yes, yeah, there's so a few more on. of them. That, yeah. That's always the, the, the trickiest thing to yeah. get your... Vowels correct. We I mean, hear that in some Gaelic names in Scotland, eh? Like as in Imervulen. Yeah. yeah. Which is an an, amy, an area of the Highlands where Loch Lubnig is. Lovely times spent there. If you're oh. in Scotland, folks, Lovely. look up Imervulen, go to Loch Lubnig, you'll have a, a great time. Anyway, just can I can I just say something else, a little side uh, side journey about the language? Yeah. Rather than learning Norwegian going through your native English language. Uh-huh. For me, it was much better going through Old Scots or any Old Scots ah. words that I knew. The words there connect much more. So is there a word for church anything like kirken? It is. Kirken. Kirka. 
Right, so you can hear there's a closeness there. Yeah, and it's spelt the same way that we would spell Kirk. With yes. the E and the N. Yeah. Well, there you go. Hundreds of words. So hundreds you got that, you got that, um, cough. How, how many yeah. levels in language are there, Mark? It's down to B2, B2 would be the highest, and then, then there's one more test called the Bergen test. Well, that so sounds you know, a bit worrying. If you've got that, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bergen test. So it's not 2B, it's B2. As, as, as Shakespeare said <laughs> <laughs> you got that mixed up right okay musical uh, right so we're you're, you've got all your qualifications yeah. and so I, I take it did they ask you to apply for a music therapy job yes well what happened was um, the, again just a, just a little insight as to the, the way things work at a, at a workplace Arbeidsplatz in, in Norway very inclusive, they'll ask the employees a lot of the time, it's very inclusive, there's, it's n- there's always no hierarchy, nobody wears a shirt and tie, teachers in schools get called by the first names by the pupils. Do you put your arm around each other's shoulder? There we go, hugs and <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so they, they actually ask, for, it's a council run thing, council funded thing, these culture schools, and they have reviews and how can we make this better, how can we make it obviously more inclusive, that's the way these days. And, and, they, and they had a little review and they wanted to find out if anybody who worked for them had any, you know, not hidden skills, but uh, any other competence that they wanted to and could could use and uh, could come up with a, a plan as how they could use it. So I just wrote a few words. I said, it'd be nice to do some work in music therapy and in and, and whatever capacity, really. So it came out of that. So getting back to music therapy, what kind of people are, are you interfacing with yeah I've got uh, the job specifically now I've got a, f- a few groups I've got one group of uh, kids in a nursery that I go and go to every every Tuesday it's an incredible department run by amazing women and it's for kids that are have all kinds of sickness some of them have got cancer uh, some of them get down some of them don't have language all kinds of things going on with them it's just an amazing department to visit the, 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 the positivity and the, the good things that come out of that. So I go there every Tuesday morning. And at first, obviously, I think to myself, the big thing about music therapy, whatever you're taught, whatever you think you might want to do with it, you've got to be very creative in how you're going to make that work practically. You've got to think for yourself, well, literally, what am I going to do tomorrow morning? And create a structure that people are going to believe in and can participate in and get something out of. So, I mean, I've got a couple of questions. I, I, I'll be... Honest with you, when when I first came across music therapy, I, I really didn't know what to make of it, and in many ways, I, I still don't. Mm. I mean, part of me wonders if if someone's profoundly disabled, mm. if it's the, for example, it seems to me there's a heavy, or what I saw, there seemed to be a heavy emphasis on percussive instruments. Yeah, mm. <clears throat> is that to do with the uh, the the person who is the recipient of the therapeutic work being able to just feel those rhythmic pulses going through their body. Um, and how does that in any way, shape or form help them? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a really interesting question. You, you're, you're wondering how and why like a percussion, a pulse, could improve somebody's health. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can go back a little bit. Sure. If you think about... Uh, by the nature of my daft brain, I'm all over the place, so no, sorry about no, that. No, no, just about, we talked about the origins of maybe the profession of music therapy, but in, in the training that I got, a lot of emphasis was on thinking about how we as human beings are innately musical, and what's in us, for example, our pulse, okay, heartbeat. Is this to do with atoms vibrating? We can go right back there, I, I, I think so, yeah, and... If you think about the origins of strings vibrating as well and overtone series, and these are very natural occurrences that that either that might be in us with for thinking of a heartbeat, a rhythmic way that we move, in whatever way. If it's just simple walking, do you take the uh, frequency of the universe into account? I, I haven't yet, no. But I've, I've heard that's uh, it's it's close to uh, four forty. Um, yeah, it's close to four forty. Incredible. Yeah. And and the weird thing is, I don't think when they decided to make if you're listening to this, folks, and you don't know what we're talking about, uh, basically, uh, it was early 20th century, they decided that all musical instruments would 
be at a concert pitch which was defined. And they defined it as A, which is under middle C on the piano, just below where the key used to be, if you're old enough to know where the key was. The A beneath that would be 440. And before 1926 or 28, whenever it happened, you could go to different parts of the world, as I understand it, and concert pitch could actually be something else. Which I find difficult to understand in relation to people who have perfect pitch now. Exactly. Because back then, I mean, how I, I don't understand perfect pitch and how someone can be born with it, especially why are they always born with it at 440? But maybe I don't, if anyone's got any ideas, if, uh, undoubtedly I probably am talking rubbish, but if anyone knows more about that, please leave it in the comments on the website or send me an email. And anyway... Yeah, back back mm. to you, back to to what you were talking about there with pulses and and things like that. Pulses, um, the way we walk, the way we move, regulations of our body that that, that will you know that can that we can have control over in, in, in our movements, motor movements, also in speech. We can talk about speech being very musical. Staccato. Or legato. We speak how we choose to speak. We can go up and down. We can almost sing when we speak. We can decide the length of phrases, how short they are. If we want to say a whole concept in two words, or if we decide to spend five minutes rambling and taking. And all of those things, as far as I can see, are exactly the same as what we do with music, melodically, ideas, how we want to communicate and I do think there's a connection between language and the music that's played in any specific region of the world. I mean, if I think about India, the way they speak yeah. and uh, the way they, they create the, the yeah. rhythms and things are very, very similar. Yeah. Um, we could probably talk about this for hours, <laughs> but I do want to kind of yeah. um, sort of get down to specifics about this. Um, yeah. How do you create... How are outcomes... For a given patient created, how are the the issues of that, if I can use it, even use mm. that word, of mm. the patient addressed? And how do you possibly know if something has been achieved, if yeah. the outcomes have been met? And if you could yeah. give an example, maybe. Yeah. It, it, it could. So we have to do, we're defining our own goals, our therapeutic goals. That's one thing. So you have a clear idea of what you might be doing. <laughs> instead of just going in and randomly making up songs or whatever. So I had a placement when I was a student uh, in a clinic in Glasgow for people who had uh, brain injury. And that's wide ranging from people who had bad alcoholism, falls, strokes. So one thing there was to get language back. That was a big... Uh, to encourage speech again, to try and do everything you could and singing and songs helped a lot with that uh, the, the speech therapist there as well used that technique as well so that when people could remember words she would create little or use known melodies to, to sing a phrase to them So and that would help them actually recreate little um, connections in the brain so that when you came to speak it would be easier so that that's one specific way you could actually measure an outcome so what if someone comes in who's profoundly disabled? Yeah. Um, I'll let you create imaginary parameters mm -hmm. on that person. Can mm -hmm. you explain to us how you would then create some sort of therapy based on... Yeah. Is that how it works? Well, I'll tell you, if somebody comes in to me, if, if, I, if we set it all up properly, we've had good communication from the start, right? Right. And I've got somebody's have... profoundly... Yeah, yeah. That, that's all. And people With the parents are, and, and all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've got an idea of what we might do. And they have to be on board, I guess. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I'm under no illusion that I'm going to heal somebody with music just, just so... They don't call you Jesus uh, over there, do they? Uh, uh, <laughs> Touching the hem of your <laughs> jeans. Certainly not, certainly not. <laughs> and I can't affect um, systems of the body that are functioning in such a way as to, as to you know, destroy... That's what I'm trying to get to exactly. here, Mark. What, what, so what am you... I doing? What am Aye. I doing if I'm not doing that? Right? Mostly what I'm doing at the moment in, in this environment, and this comes from the Norway uh, social kind of setup as well, uh, I'm, I'm given experience. I, I'm setting the, the nursery uh, group mm -hmm. 
I try to do a lot of one-to-one -one improvisation, which is an experience, right? And as you say, we encourage kids to use percussion instruments and that. But we found out later what, what works so much better is they have a little uh, assembly every day, you know, at school. Or, mm -hmm. And it's a very, very strong tradition in Norway of Norwegian songs, child songs. That are, that are some, it's a massive repertoire. So adults know them and children get taught them generation after generation. Is there a grandma in most of these songs? There can be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a farmer. There's a troll in most of them, actually. Ah, yeah. right. That's yes. what it would be. Yeah. <laughs> He's not under a bridge, is he? Often. Is he? Often. What's it with trolls and bridges? Go figure. Three oh. early goats gruff. That's a, that's ah. a Norwegian one, yeah. Is that Norwegian? Play book and book, sir. Yeah. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> I never knew that. I don't know if it comes from there, but we've got that. Uh, uh -huh. that that's uh, a massive one. It's funny, yeah, because they probably didn't have a lot of bridges around in those days. So probably if you were not, maybe you're not that sure of a bridge. I know the Romans built loads of bridges, yeah. but there'd be places where there wasn't. So under bridges, you know, there's that, but you just can't kind of quite see under yeah. what's what's going on under yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. So it is quite interesting that the 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 are troll under a bridge. I know, I know. Creepy. You just take it for yeah, it's a troll under a bridge, big deal. But yeah. actually. You know, why a bridge? He could have been round the corner. I know. <clears throat> Didn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> so, are so you, sorry, I'm using this. I'm using yeah. that these songs as my structure. Right, that, that's that's my hour, forty minutes. Right, and what am I going to do with them? And I'm doing it in collaboration with the women. It just happens to be women that are that are working in this department. Okay. So, they, they they're not necessarily. Musicians, well, they're not musicians, but they sing with mm. kids. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, so we'll set up. It's not just singing songs for the kids. You you'll give little, um, maybe little opportunities for them to come in and sing. It's your turn. Now it's your turn to learn to learn social skills in the music as well. Now it's your turn to listen. Now it's your turn to participate. Now it's your turn to play this. Now it's your turn to be quiet structure in what could be a chaotic life for them as well you know and all these I would put them down as social regulations social meaning how you socialise yourself in a society so if you're you know for a kid and you're maybe out of control and don't have so much control over some of your thoughts or body movements and you can come in and use music in a way that, that gives you a, an experience of actually having some control that's where I was just about to get to because it was com coming the, the thought was coming into a mind that, you you know, you 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 were seriously, I made it light of it, but you seriously say, you know, I'm not a healer, <laughs> but is it about uh, behaviour modification and trying to address the undoubted frustrations that must come with, you know, if you've got, if your brain is 100%, but you're, you're basically trapped in yeah. a body that isn't, that yeah. must be incredibly frustrating. Oh my gosh, yeah. Of Almost course. everyone's... Nightmare, but the stuff of nightmares. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. The behaviour thing, that that's a whole side of, of music therapy. That I think it's, it's when I was studying, they, they, they didn't treat that, the behaviourism model, very kindly. But I think it's actually quite a, quite a useful model. I, I, I would use it a lot in the, in the situation. I'm operating as a music therapist in an educational system, setting system as well. So that could be different if you're operating as a music therapist in a health setting we actually do maybe have specific goals a patient might want to get some more uh, motor control back in his left hand so giving him a percussion instrument if he can try and grab it and, and create a pulse and and have the motivation to maybe I'm playing a guitar or a musical instrument singing finding out songs that we like to play together and the patient then has the motivation because well we all get motivated by music to, to, to join in and play. That can be one thing. So you could call that as a very definite motor skill retraining exercise if you want to <laughs> if you want to go down there. My setting at the moment is in education and it's and it's with uh, either very small kids and I've got another group with older kids but they're very disabled as well. And we're, we're just there's all sorts of techniques or strategies, activities you could do. I like to think of a two, three minute activity. What we're we doing for these two, three minutes are the people that are taking part in it clear and comfortable as to what they're going to do? Are they just sitting listening? 
should they participate? You know? Have you established um, sort of routes to out- certain outcomes that you see again and again within certain groups? Because I know this must be really difficult to pin down because mm. everyone's an individual mm. and everyone has specific needs. But is there some areas where you go, this person is exhibiting this or, or, or you know, has does not is not able to do X, Y, and Z, this would be a good... Aha. Yeah, so you're, it's all slightly prescriptive almost that you're yes. thinking about. I've not come across that as yet. The, the, the <coughs> biggest <coughs> thing, and, and I'm thinking generally here, the biggest thing I see a response to is is the music and songs, and some specific songs that are Norwegian <laughs> that, that all the kids and all the adults and everybody responds to. And I figure ways that how we can get people involved in recognising, taking part, and having a, they call it a sampling, like assembly, taking part in a, in a social fun situation. And I can think of it like in a cult, cult, culture school context, it's a social activity in the same way that, that a kid might go for guitar lessons who's not really wanting to be the next Steve Vai but just wants to, you know, make some fun noise in an electric guitar. The same for these students who are disabled can come for a music activity. So the word therapy could be on a spectrum as to whether you're using it prescriptively to help somebody lift something, improve motor skills in an arm, or whether you're actually giving somebody a good social integrative experience that, that's, that's worthwhile. And so I've got three kind of questions <laughs> left to ask you, Mark. <clears throat> I suppose this is maybe a trope, but for someone who is profoundly disabled, um, blind, uh, deaf and dumb, I don't know if these are words you can use these days, but you forgive me, listener, if I'm um, upsetting anyone by using those. It's just my um, perhaps lack of keeping up with what is used with the vernacular. But if someone is that, I mean, profoundly disabled, do you take these people on? And if you do, what can you expect to help them with and how would you know if you have helped them I, I must admit I, I draw an absolute blank there I, I have not had any experience of that ok so because there are people like yeah. that in the world isn't yeah. there <clears throat> and Nord of Robin uh, not Nord of um, music therapy yeah. is is that not for them that, that, that's uh, you, you've stumped me with that, that fantastic question there Do, what I would think is that people who are deaf can always hear something, can always have some kind of, uh, some small hearing. I don't know how far that would that would be uh, useful in a music therapy mm-hmm. context. I, I guess rhythmically they can, they can still feel yeah. pulse. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. these are challenging, challenging Absolutely. questions. Absolutely. Um, the other question I had for you was oversights and outcomes from uh, the educational body and the council and ultimately the the Norwegian government. Is this something that really only happens because you happen to live, uh, work and lead your life in a country that is quite enlightened Mm -hmm. and wants to take the time over these things? I mean, does anyone hold you to account on the outcomes that you are or aren't coming up with? Um, Yeah, we have have reviews at the end of the year. my boss regularly checks in on my work and uh, the, the, the main thing, I collaborate with the, the people who are in the group and that can be the, the parents or carers of the, of the children or the students that are there. And I constantly check, you know, what can we do, plan with them. So it's it's more than just me organising a group. I, I, I feel they're quite open and they're both... It's inclusive. And they are, they're technically open groups. What I mean by that is people, students can come in, in and out of groups. Students grow up. Kids grow up and go to school. New new kids come in the nursery. Uh, other students come in and out of the other groups that, that I create as well. So I've actually thought of another question before I ask you uh, the last one, which is, what's the most profound change you've seen in, in someone that, that's come through your doors? Ah, that's a good question. I, I I remember actually it was when I was a student, I think. So I was doing some one to one work in, in that clinic in Glasgow with. Uh, with a client who had been a long-term alcohol alcoholic and his memory kind of gone. He was in and out of that clinic after having various falls. And I started doing one-to-one sessions with him every week. 
he would always t he had a harmonica and he always talk about songs from the maybe the seventies hits and everything that he, that he liked to play and he would quote some lyrics. So I'd scribble down ten songs that he talked about and next time come in and play them with him, you know. And, but there was one song I don't remember the, the, what it was, but there was one song we got together and sang a verse and a chorus with him, and he was singing along and playing some harmonica. And out of nowhere, they just kind of broke down and cried and said, "Oh, that song was number one hit when my daughter was born." So it was just a, a slam, a connection out so of nowhere yeah. that he hadn't remembered. That was oh, I'm getting goosebumps there. That must be a wonderful the, moment. Yeah. So my, my last. Um, it, it's my last question is to anyone listening in the world who um, has children or anyone who they uh, who should be looking for musical therapy um, that's the first question who, who, who should consider it either for themselves or one of their loved ones and what would be the best I know you can't do a pan world uh, mm. explanation here but what would be the first sort of way of trying to find out about it Really good questions. I, I think that um, you, you don't always have to think of music therapy as being practiced by a professional music therapist. Because it's going back to what musical skills have we got? Is there something in a family that can play some simple chords on a guitar or a piano? That can sing a bit, that can engage somebody in a song, that can that can have a little... We do it all with our kids when they grow up anyway, don't we? Mm -hmm. We play little rhythmic games and... And they've got so many of these clapping games in the playground. Try and think of that as a starting point for anybody that, that you could, you know, have, have fun with in a, in a musical way. And that would be a good starting point. Other than that, I would, I, would, I would look for a music therapy in the area. Certainly that I am, they often operate out of these schools I'm talking so about. So is it worldwide way. music therapy? Is it, 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 is it recognised worldwide? It's recognised worldwide. I don't know how many countries ha have it as an official title. Is is it is it any part of the pr program if it is such a thing mm. online? Yes, I would. I would. Uh, well, I would check out the Nordoff Robin certainly and the uh, website for maybe more of a UK based thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've got that in in Norway where I live. But Google search music therapy and you'll you'll find you'll find them working in all different areas in health, in hospitals, in dementia. We mentioned that in nurseries. And uh, so, are you one of the only people? in Norway doing this that was inspired by Nord of Robbins? It, it could be, actually, as it found out. And I'm, the, I'm the first uh, music therapist at that school, which is unusual for most of the other schools have music therapists. They do? Yeah. So and, they, and where did they pick up their training from? They have... Uh, there's a there's a university in Bergen. I think it's just there in Norway that, that offers a, a course. It's joint, they call it, it's pedagogic course and music therapy course. It's and that was in, was that inspired by the work of Nord of Robbins? It's not specifically based on that work, so I think it's broader than that. I think it's broader than that, and that would mean that they'd incorporate other things that, that, are, that are a bit more modern than, than the Nord of Robbins literature of working in that one specific school and specific outcomes, because there were some very specific approaches to the meaning of musical intervals that... Uh, that, that people tend not to go into these days because mm -hmm. it's it's quite subjective, I think. By the way, that, that, that just triggers something in my mind. Do you use harmonics and things like that to excite people? Yeah. Can well, you... Uh, I, I mean, I meant that... I, I, I was going to uh, wrap this up, but that, that's an interesting area, the whole idea of resonance, yeah. harmonics yeah. and vibration. Yeah. So you use that. I use that, and in, in, uh, in the group I've got, we've got two or three kids in, in wheelchairs. As so I walk, it was great having a guitar. You can walk around, and I, once I know that people are okay, being comfortable with me getting close mm -hmm. and playing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I play quite loudly mm -hmm. in, into them, if I can mm -hmm. say that into them. Sometimes I'll just gently put a harmonic in somebody's ear. I just say a, a harmonic is uh, it's it's like a glassy type sound, and. Um, you were talking earlier about the 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 fundamental the harmonic series. Um, it, it's a, a reasonably big s subject, but basically, there is um, if you take a, a log and or a metal pipe and bang it, you create uh, something called overtones, and they're always it's always produced in the same order called octaves, and it's to do with intervals. But the upper partials 
or where the harmonics lie. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, that's yeah. my understanding. Yeah. That is very interesting. And the, do you find that certain um, notes and harmonics and vibrations get more um, like minor second intervals? Um, for example, folks at home, this is uh, an example with my, I've just picked my guitar up of a minor second interval. It sounds very, uh, I'll just put my pen down, it sounds very crunchy. That sounds quite unpleasant. But the paradox of this minor second interval, which is means it's like Jaws, is that if I put it within the context of a chord, that's how the most beautiful chords are created, the paradox being that in their core is this very crunchy interval. Do you find these intervals have more effect on people than, say, thirds? Or I think they have a lot of value because I, I love the tension that it creates and it can, you can hold on and hold on it and hold on it and then maybe release it into a chord like that. And then I, I do notice that effect, yes, yes. Just to, on the wrap-up, um, can you tell us a little about your guitar tuition? Um, how much of that do you do a week and how does that fit in with... Uh, your music therapy work? Yeah, it fits in because actually part of my um, music therapy job is to advise the other uh, teachers in the school if they have uh, kids that come with a diagnosis of anything from autism to ADHD. So um, what I've noticed is that most of their teachers are incredible with dealing with <laughs> that situation. They, they don't really need much advice or tips from me. I'm not a specialist. There's no prescription. This kid is autistic. So you must do this. It's very much just uh, we, have, we have to maybe change our goals of what we're thinking about doing here. Are we teaching music? Or are we having more of an experience? But um, you're talking about the, the, the guitar tuition. I can take some of that side into my guitar tuition as well. It, it's short. 20 minute lessons is what you get at culture schools. Right. Short, short, short. So you have to plan it a bit more carefully what we're doing this year. Well, does that mean that you, when you go to, we're jumping all the place, yeah. typical of yeah. creative people, but does that mean when you go to culture school, you get 20 minutes on this instrument and 20 minutes on... No, you choose one instrument ah. and your weekly tuition is uh, usually 20 minutes. One to one? One to one, 20 minutes. You That's amazing. Them. You get one to one lessons. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not in groups. Some, yeah, there's some dance, uh, yeah, of course, that would be, but on, on instrumental tuition, generally you get one to one in 20 minutes. You know, to get 20 minutes, even 20 minutes, one to one is fantastic. I mean, I teach at a uni, yeah, they get 40 minutes, yeah. and, and that's like an outlier, yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's anywhere else in Scotland that does one to one tuition anymore. No, it's, uh, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's a great opportunity, is what I can think of. Yeah. Not every student will take it, but it's, it's there, and I'll just make sure I off, make sure I offer it's, it's there. Guys, if you want to take it seriously, I'm here every week with bells on. <laughs> what can so, I say? Mark, just before I wrap this up, anything you would kind of feel that I haven't addressed that maybe needs stating? Maybe I don't. So I've talked about my specific areas of work, and we're talking about kids with physical and quite severe uh, challenges. But it is used in a lot of different ways, music therapy. It's used... It can be used in lighter ways. It might be a crossover with community music where, you know, you're a semi-professional musician, maybe taking a choir or something or, or helping people playing in bands. Um, it's used in health. I know so the, here, dementia. Sorry. Or, so the, the, the umbrella's quite wide now. I think it is. Because um, I always think music therapy, you were talking about I know. very disabled children, but yeah, that's just yeah. the, the wrong it's, it's not What I'm saying is just not just that. And I think... So, and it depends on which setting you're using, and obviously it depends on funding, where you're going to get funding from, if you're going to afford to hire somebody in for a whole year or a whole day. That Do you depends. find it helps people with depression? Uh, I, I imagine so, just by the very, the very use of music therapeutically. You're engaging in something so positive. Mm-hmm. If you're actually, you could even sometimes you, music theory could, could be listening, could be active listening to music, which is what we do anyway as musicians. Well, I was going to say, I mean, even I can say from my own personal experience, you know, I play music almost every day, most days. Uh, if I'm not teaching it, I'm uh, performing it, or, you know, or I'm composing, or I'm I'm just playing for my own self enjoyment, I guess. And I can honestly say that, you know. 
although it's, it's not great to just focus in on this, but if I have been feeling down about this or the next thing, then music helps in a huge way because you just forget all your problems. You're just focusing on the music. Mark, I'd like to thank you so much for this very, at times, deep and interesting interview. And it's great to actually, we, we usually see each other on a Thursday morning over <laughs> Skype. Yeah. So it's just great to actually uh, yeah, have some time with a you. Pleasure. Uh, a pleasure, always.